Hello and welcome to Controllers Tech. This is the fifth video in the ESP32 series using the Espressif IDE, and today we will cover the SBI peripheral. We have already covered the UART and I2C peripherals of the ESP32, so this video will start the SBI peripheral. We will cover the basic functioning of the SBI peripheral in a three-part video series. Today in part 1 of the series we will see how to configure the SBI peripheral, and how to transmit the data to the slave device. Although I am not going to connect any slave device in today's video, instead we will use the scope to see the data transmitted by the ESP32 master. Let's start the Espressif IDE, and created a new project. We will use one of the templates to create the project. Look for the SBI templates here. Let's use this SBI slave sender project, this is a simple project, therefore I am using this one. Let's rename the project to SBI1. Make sure that the correct target board is selected. Alright the project has been created, and here we have the main file. We will modify this entire file, but let's build it once first. Let's delete this commented part. This project uses some kind of handshake between master and slave devices. We don't need to use any handshake, therefore let's delete this part. Next we need to define the SBI pins. I am using the 38 pin ESB Vroom 32 board, which you can purchase from controllers tech dot store. Here you can see the pin out of this board. There are multiple instances of the SBI peripheral available here. We can either use the VSBI or the HSBI. You can see the pin assignments for both the SBI instances. I am going to use the VSBI, therefore the pins must be defined accordingly. The MOSI pin is 23, MISO is 19, CLOCK is 18, and SLAVE SELECT is pin 5. These are configured as per the pin definition in the diagram. The code is using the HSBI host, so let's change it to VSBI host. We will define the SBI host for this project. We are not receiving any data, so let's remove this part. Again we have the code related to the handshake, so let's delete this part too. We will define a separate function to initialize the SBI. Here we have the code for initializing the SPI peripheral. Let's remove this handshake related part again. Here we have separate configurations for configuring the SPI device and for configuring the SPI bus. Let's copy these configurations in the initialization function we just defined. We will need the SPI device handle in other functions as well, so let's define it globally. Let's define it as SBI handle. All right inside the SBI initialization function, we will first configure the SBI bus. Here we need to define the SBI MOSI, MISO, and the clock pins. The quad pins are used in case of quad SBI mode, therefore they are defined as minus one, as we are not using the quad SBI. Next we have the configuration for the SBI device. The command bits, address bits, and dummy bits are kept to zero for now, we will use them when required. Today we will only focus on transmitting data, therefore we do not need to worry about them. The SBI clock is set at 5 MHz. We don't need a high speed clock for testing, so let's change it to 2 MHz. The duty cycle value is set to 128, which is actually 50% duty cycle. The SBI is configured with mode 0, so both clock phase and clock polarity are low. Then we need to declare the chip select pin. The next parameter is used to keep the CS pin low after the SBI transaction. We don't need it, so let's delete it for now. Finally we have the queue size, which is the amount of transactions that can be in the queue at the same time. Let's leave it to 3. You can find more details about these structures in the SBI master header file. Keep holding the control button and click on the structure. 
Here you can see the details about all the members of the device interface configuration structure. We can also use the callback for the SPI, but it is used in combination with the interrupt. Today we will use a simple method to get the SPI working, so no callback is being used. So far we have only defined the parameters for the configurations, we haven't configured the SPI yet. Let's delete this handshake part. Here are the functions to configure the SPI bus, and to add the SPI device. Let's copy them inside our initialization function. The first function is used to initialize the SPI bus. Let's change this host ID to SPI host. The second parameter of this function is the configuration for the SPI bus. Then the last parameter is used to select the DMA channel, which we want to use for the SPI. We are leaving this selection to auto, therefore the driver will select it automatically. The next function adds the device to the SPI bus. The first parameter is the host ID, then we have the device configuration itself, and the last parameter is the device handle. We have declared the device handle as SPI handle. Alright that is all we need to initialize the SPI driver. Next we will write a new function to transmit the data to the slave device. The parameters of this function will be, pointer to the data buffer that we want to transmit, and the number of bytes to be transmitted. This example uses the function, SPI device transmit to send the data, so we will use the same function to do so. This function actually adds the SPI transaction to the queue, and then waits for the transaction to complete. We can also use other functions like SPI device polling transmit, to transmit the data in the polling mode. I am using the SPI device transmit function to do the same. Let's copy this transaction definition inside our function. The SPI transaction structure contains all the information about the data being sent or received on the SPI bus. You can find more details about the members of this structure in the SPI master header file. The first member of the transaction is the flags. Different types of flags are defined just above this structure. You can even combine two or more flags by performing the OR operation. We will discuss the command and address parameters in the upcoming tutorials. The length parameter holds the total length in bits. This length includes the length of the data to be transmitted, and the data to be received as well. But remember that this parameter is in bits, not bytes. The Rx length parameter holds the amount of data to be received. If this parameter is set to zero in full duplex mode, its value will be the same as the length parameter. Next we have the pointer to the buffer, which we want to transmit. We can also use the TX data array to store the data to be transmitted, but this array is only used when the SPI trans use TX data flag is set in the flags. Similarly, we can either use the pointer to the Rx buffer to store the received data, or use the Rx data array in combination with the SPI trans use Rx data flag. The problem with these Rx data and TX data arrays is that they can only store 4 bytes of data at once. I am going to use the buffers instead, as they are easier to use. Alright let's populate the SBI transaction structure. The pointer to the transmit buffer is the pointer to the data parameter of the function. We already have the length in the function's parameter, so let's just convert it to bits. Note that I am not setting any other member of the structure, so they all are set to zero. Now we will call the function SBI device transmit to send the transaction. The handle is SBI handle, and the transaction structure is defined above. We need to pass the address of the structure here. If this function returns any error, we will print an error message on the console. That is all we need for transmitting the data on the SBI bus. Let's delete everything from the main function. We will now define a new data array to store the data to be transmitted. Let's store 4 bytes of random data in it. Inside the main function we will call the SBI init, to initialize the SBI driver. 
Now inside the while loop call the function SPI transmit to transmit the data array we just defined. Let's give a delay of 2 seconds between each call to this function. Include the uni standard header file to access the sleep function. Since we are not using RTOS, let's remove these inclusions from here. Alright let's build the project once. The SPI host is already declared in the system file somewhere, so we need to change the name here. Let's rename it to ESP host. We also need to change the host ID inside the initialization functions. Alright the project builds fine now. I am going to use a logic analyzer to capture the SPI signals. Here we need to configure the SPI in the analyzer too. The slave select pin is connected to channel 0, clock is connected to channel 1, and the MOSI is connected to channel 2. We are using the most significant bit first, there are 8 bits per transfer, and the clock mode is 0. Before flashing the project to the board, make sure the correct target and serial port is selected. Alright let's flash the project to the board now. We can check the printf output in the terminal. We did not get this writing error, that means the code must be working fine. Let's write a new log after transmitting the data, this is just to make sure the data was sent without any issue. Alright let's flash the project again. You can see the successful log is printing on the terminal every 2 seconds. This means that the data was sent successfully. Let's check the data on the analyzer. Here you can see the chip select pin goes low before the transmission begins. The SBI clock is 2 MHz, this is exactly what we set it at. Then the MOSI line shows the 4 data bytes transmitted by the ESB32. This is the same data which we defined in the data array. So the ESB32 as master, is able to transmit the data via the SBI. Let's send some string now. Here I am defining a character pointer, which points to the string to be transmitted. The SPI transmit function takes another data type, so we need to typecast the character pointer to the unsigned integer pointer. The number of bytes can be calculated using the string length function. That is it, let's build and flash the project to the board again. We are receiving data every 2 seconds on the analyzer. Let me change the type to ASCII. Here you can see the exact same string is intercepted by the analyzer. So the SBI transmission works fine. You can use the SBI transmit function to transmit any amount of data to the slave device. We will cover how to read the data back from the slave device in the next two parts of this series. I am going to use the W25Q flash memory as the slave device, and we will see how to write the data into this memory device, and how to read the data back from it. This is it for today. You can download the code from the link in the description. Leave comments in case of any doubt. Keep watching, and have a nice day ahead.